Hello, everyone. Welcome. Glad you're with us. We'll give folks a few minutes here to log on. Hope your Tuesday is going well. All right. It seems to be slow. Well, it's still moving up. Give it another little bit here, and then we're going to go ahead and get rolling. Glad you are all with us here today. All right. Well, let's go ahead and get started then. Hello, everyone. My name is Denise Harlow. I'm CEO of the National Community Action Partnership. And today is one of our sessions where we're gonna do an overview and introduction to community action. We try to host these sessions live twice a year. We know a lot of folks in community action, there's always new folks coming in, whether it's board members, um, staff, executive directors, volunteers, customers, partners in the community. We are glad you're here to uh, learn more about community action. Thanks so much, everyone, for participating in the chat. Um, please feel free to um, introduce yourselves to each other. And I believe the chat and the Q&A boxes are available to you. Uh, to ask questions and we'll pause periodically to check those boxes to make sure there are if there are questions. I think you also have the opportunity to, to ask to speak out loud as well. So uh, Madison Wicks behind the scenes is gonna help us navigate that. If you'd like to talk or ask a question, please uh, put that into the chat and we'll do our best to get you unmuted today. We are recording today's session and it will be available up on our website and through our e-newsletter. If you're not on our e-newsletter list, please email me and we will make sure to get you signed up. So let's get started. There's a lot of content here today. We're going to start off like we do every presentation at the partnership with the promise of community action. We're going to talk about this here today that all CAP agencies, right, there's a different name, maybe you have a different logo, a different tagline, maybe a different mission statement. And that's okay. It's all about local control, local decision making, what works in your local community is what matters. But what binds us together is the promise of community action. It's posted up on our offices in DC. I walk into a lot of community action agencies and state association offices and it's posted there as well. It's on our letterhead. It is on our board agendas. Community action changes people's lives, embodies the spirit of hope, improves communities, and makes America a better place to live. We care about the entire community, and we are dedicated to helping people help themselves and each other. And I'll tell you, every time you read this promise, depending on the day, a different part of the promise will jump out at you. Kind of depends on what's going on in your own life, what's going on at your organization, your stresses, your joys, Different things will jump off at you at different times. And this is our promise to the community, to our families that we serve, and to each other. So I encourage you to, to take this, make it your own, find ways to post it in your office, make sure that you keep an eye on it and, and reflect on it on a regular basis. So community action, we could be talking for three, four hours here today about all the pieces and components of community action. So we're going to try to give you some of the core elements that I think are important as, as the partnership CEO. And also, I know we have some folks on the, on the call today who are preparing for their CCAP um, uh, study groups and exams and all that sort of thing coming up in 2022. So we're going to highlight a few uh, core elements there as well. But what I want to share with you right off the bat is that your local agency or your state association or your state CSBG office or your partner in the, in the community, there are a thousand local community action agencies all across this country in every corner of America. We serve 99% of America's counties, whether your state is more red or more blue or purple or your local community. Each agency reflects its own community. And we cross, we're, we're non-political, we are non-partisan, we are here to serve families. There are about 44, 45 state associations and regional associations around this country. And I'm also going to use the term of our kind of state CSBG agencies. And we'll talk about what more that means. And I think we have some state folks with us on the call here today. And then there are national partners. And we're going to walk you through each of these core components of this network because there's a lot of complexity here, right? And, and what do all these things mean? And you hear a lot of acronyms. And we want to make sure to kind of give you some of those nuts and bolts. 
So let's start off with the grandfather of community action, Sergeant Shriver. Sergeant Shriver was the first director of the Office of Economic Opportunity, asked to be uh, the head of that office by President Lyndon Johnson. And if you go online or if you attend David Bradley's History of the War on Poverty, you can hear some of the recordings of uh, Lyndon John, President Johnson asking Sergeant Shriver to, to lead this office. There's some colorful language um, as part of that conversation. Uh, President Johnson was known for his directness. And um, Sergeant Shriver had um, some visions of what he wanted to do but he agreed to be the grandfather of community action. I love this quote though. What can change the world today is the same thing that has changed it in the past. An idea and the service of dedicated, committed individuals to that idea. That resonated in 1964, that resonates today in 2021. So in the chat window, I'd love for you to be able to post a word or two uh, that you think about that, that resonates with you when you hear community action. What does it mean to you? What, what, what triggers in your mind when you hear community action? What goes, and if you put that in the chat, uh, that would be fantastic. Service, collaboration, impact, partnerships, community, resources, life saving. Wow, that, that's impactful. Assistance, taking action to support your community connection, empowerment. Fantastic. Every Community action means something different to everybody and at different points in your life. I started a community action agency as a social worker working with adolescents in 1994 in Schenectady Community Action Program in upstate New York. I spent time at the State Association in New York, and I've been here at the partnership for 10 years, seven years in this chair, and I'm always learning something new about community action. I would answer this question different every day um, over the past 27 years. I can't quite do the math. Um, but every day, something about community action strikes me different. I learn something new, and I get excited by it every day. So is community action different? Yes, it is. Just as all of these partner organizations you see here on the slide, Salvation Army, Neighbor Works, Red Cross, Catholic Charities, Lutheran Social Services, United Jewish Federation, there are a lot of organizations across this country working to help families. And we partner with all of these organizations in deep and meaningful ways. There are elements that make community action different. And we're gonna talk a bit about those pieces and components, but you are part of a unique network. And we're not necessarily as well known, right? As some of these other networks as well. And I'll tell you, that's the number one question I usually get. Why don't people know about community action? And it is a challenge. We'll talk a bit more about our branding and how we tell that story and how we connect to each other. But we do have some unique components of our network. So while we certainly address you know, similar community challenges, we have a unique history. We have a federal mandate and statute to harness all available public and private resources to end poverty in America. That is a mission, a purpose, and a vision that I can get behind. It gets my blood going every day to be able to step up and do this hard, hard work every day. We are the designated U.S. infrastructure to fight poverty, how and where we find it. What happens in Topeka is going to be different than what happens in Toledo. What happens in Dayton is going to be different than happens in Detroit. And that matters. It matters that the local community decides for itself what's going to be important. But we're all bound together under the umbrella of community action. We're going to talk a bit more about CSBG, the Community Services Block Grant. So keep that in the back of your mind. But what CSBG gives us is our designation as a low as, as community action. If you get CSBG money through your state office, you're a community action agency, public, private, single purpose, limited purpose. There's a lot of lingo out there, but you are community action. CSBG is meant to be flexible. It's one of those few federal block grants that actually the state doesn't even have control over. It's about local agencies and their boards of directors determining what this federal block grant is going to be used for. It's an amazing opportunity. It's an amazing responsibility, too. We're going to talk about that. There's a high level accountability when it comes to community action because CSBG, CSBG state folks, right, they monitor 
And a lot of agencies get monitored, right? But state CSBG offices look at the entirety of the organization. Agencies might only get $200,000 of CSBG, but they might be a $40 million nonprofit organization. But that little bit of CSBG, A, it's very flexible, it's your social capital, but it brings a lot of accountability right along with it. And we'll talk a bit more about that. What a lot of folks know us for is what's called the tripartite board. And I saw in the chat, we have some folks from the board um, of local agencies with us as well. One third of the boards are democratically selected individuals from who have been democratically selected by the communities with low income. Now that's a whole training in and of itself. How do you democratically select individuals? But the idea is maximum feasible participation. The families who are struggling, families living with low income are the best deciders about what's right for them and how resources can be used most effectively in their local communities. One third of our board are elected officials. Now that's, that's a unique element, right? You'll see a number of organizations where perhaps 51% of the board are customers or consumers of services. To have elected officials also sitting at the table and then one third from the private sector tells us that the entire community has a responsibility to work together to end poverty, to go to the causes and conditions of poverty. And finally, we are statutorily mandated to do a needs assessment in our community to look at available, to look at needs in our community and to look at resources available in our community so we can find that path, so we don't duplicate services, so we work with partners to solve transportation issues, health access issues, um, community violence issues. We work together in all of that. Now, there, well, there's a ton of stuff up on our website, and I know it's really hard to navigate our website. I'll just say that right off the bat. I understand that. So if you ever are looking for something specific and you can't find it, email one of our team members, including myself, and we'll try to send you the direct link to it. But this is language that we have up on our site that's, that's helpful to frame up community action to both internal and also external audiences. That community action connects individuals and families to approaches that help them succeed. Success is defined by our customers, not by us. This includes high quality education programs for children, job training for adults, stable and affordable housing, et cetera, right? There's a myriad of programs and services we provide. Second, we promote community-wide solutions to seemingly stubborn challenges. You've heard that poverty is a wicked problem. It certainly is, it's complex. It's unique to local communities. And this bullet talks about our community level change efforts that we engage with. We help families, but we're also engaged on macro level change issues. And then third, we share our expertise with national, state, and local leaders looking for evidence on what works to promote greater economic opportunity for families and children. And during COVID, we saw states and national leaders say, community action, you have this expertise, you know what works, we're gonna take emergency rental dollars and go through community action. We have unemployment issues, we're gonna go right through community action. We need food distributed, distributed, excuse me, we're gonna go through community action. You have concerns about how we're running this particular program, let's ask you community action on what really works in local communities. So we're gonna talk um, certainly a bit about poverty. We talked about going up, we'll talk about going upstream to, to address the causes of poverty, not just the conditions. But when we think about poverty, I want you to have this quote from Brian Stevenson in the back of your mind. The opposite of poverty isn't wealth. The opposite of poverty is justice. And we'll talk a bit later about the partnerships work and the network's history in the civil rights movement and in today's efforts to move toward a society that embraces racial equity, that fights for racial justice because we understand that poverty is undergirded by structural racism and other inequities that we must work to dismantle if we're truly gonna end poverty in America. So I'm gonna show you the vision, mission, values, all that kind of good stuff. This stuff is yours to work with in the local community how you see fit. Our board of directors is made up of representatives of community action agencies across this country, both regionally, we have 10 regional reps, and six officers elected by you throughout the country. They've set this vision for the partnership. 
The vision of the partnership is a nation that creates opportunities for all people to thrive, build strong, resilient communities, and ensures a more equitable society. Now that is a macro level vision statement. But if we don't shoot for the, the horizon, we won't get there. We want to build and ensure a more equitable society for everyone in our country. Our value statements. We believe that all people should be treated with dignity and respect and recognize that structural race, gender, and other inequities remain barriers that must be addressed. It's our number one value statement. Number two. We believe that this nation has the capacity and moral obligation to ensure that no one is forced to endure the hardships of poverty. Oftentimes with this one, I talk about that a lot of folks come to this work due to faith. And as we talked about earlier, there are a number of partner networks that we work with that are, are grounded in faith institutions. And this is kind of a secular version of that. But we believe that this country has the moral obligation as one of the richest countries in the world to do this. This is an issue of political will, not resources. Number three, we believe that with hope, adequate resources and opportunities, everyone can reach their fullest potential. And we are committed to achieving that vision. We believe that everyone can reach their fullest potential. Not what we define it, but what they define it for themselves. And we pledge ourselves to creating an environment that pursues innovation and excellence through multi-sector collaboration and partnerships. We're not gonna end poverty alone. We have to partner with, with other organizations in our community, school systems, other nonprofit organizations, other governmental entities, uh, state governmental officials, national partners, the entire country must be focused on these efforts. But poverty today is complex, we know that. And poverty shifts. Poverty today is not what it was 20 years ago. It looks different. It ebbs and flows different. Pockets look different. I believe the poverty rate in suburban America, more than half of, of families who live in poverty live in suburban America. We know rural poverty is deep. We talk about counties that have consistent poverty over time. This is deep in our country. We know income disparities continue to, to grow. There's a picture of a small slide there that's part of another slide deck that I often do that talk about the research that Raj Chetty has done. That's a name to kind of put in your back pocket. Look up Raj Chetty. He has the 10 slides you need to know, basically, um, through Brookings Institute. Poor men die a decade earlier. It's a fact. If you look at his, his data, he has big data sets, and he has amazing data to back up pieces that you need to talk about in your local community. We understand wealth disparities. Income is one thing, but wealth and assets is a whole nother bucket, right? Who, what's the home ownership rate? What are, what are retirement savings looking like? What do savings accounts look like? And how, do those, um, how are those varying by race and gender and ethnicity? Racial inequality, racial inequity. We'll talk more about that, but that is deep and rooted in our country's history and remains today a critical issue we need to tackle. Educational disparities, health disparities, affordable housing. The aging of America is coming like a freight train. Uh, we have a lot of folks, the boomers are still retiring on an average 10,000 a day. People are not prepared for retirement. They're carrying debt into retirement. The Great Recession 10, 12 years ago had an impact, and we know the pandemic now is having his impact. I see a question in the chat, Raj Chetty, C-H-E-T-T-Y, first name Raj, R-A-J. Thank you for asking that, Chris. And then the COVID pandemic. We know that COVID is gonna have lasting impact. Community Action has done amazing work over the last 20 months to step up and to help families. And you're still doing it every day. You never really closed, did you? You stayed open, you're helping families and you're, you, you are doing amazing work. But poverty coming out of this pandemic, again, we're gonna see shifts. Things are gonna be different and we need to be prepared. All right, some more nuts and bolts. Let's talk about some of our national partners. You have the partnership. We're your national membership association. We're gonna talk a little bit about cap law. We'll certainly talk about NCAF up, up on the Hill lobbying for us. We're gonna talk about the Office of Community Services, the National Association for State Community Services Programs, and answer at the Association for Nationally Certified Roma Trainers. Well, cap law. I don't know if you've ever had to call an attorney 
for an issue or a problem. But we are blessed in community action to have cap law. Up in Boston, they're a national organization. They have attorneys on staff who are the most, <coughs> excuse me, specific experts on CSBG. I'll put them up against anybody on Head Start, weatherization, issues that impact community action. If you have questions or concerns, you can call cap law. You can email cap law. Their resource library is significant tons of information, tons of webinars. Their conference is in June. This year, it'll be in Chicago. I believe at the end of the month, right before 4th of July holiday. I hope I'll see you in Chicago for the Cap Law Conference. Allison Maloof is the executive director and does fantastic work. Speaking of fantastic work, NCAF, the National Community Action Foundation, David Bradley. Uh, David Bradley um, is the founder of NCAF. He helped found Cap Law. He's one of the authors of the Community Services Block Grant and today is fighting for CSBG reauthorization. David is, NCAF is a 501c4 advocacy organization. He does lobby on the Hill on behalf of CSBG and weatherization and community action writ large. He right now is very focused on CSBG reauthorization. I'm sure you've seen his emails and I encourage you as a local organization, um, if you haven't subscribed to Cap Facts, I encourage you to do so. Get the most updated information from David, support his efforts, and we can certainly talk more about NCAF and their work and CSBG reauthorization as we go through here uh, this session. The Federal Office of Community Services. This is where CSBG sits in that federal um, complex environment, right? You have the Federal Department of Health and Human Services, you have the Administration for Children and Families, which is the human services side of the health and human services side. I will say that the health side is where the boatload of the money is. But human services, the Administration for Children and Families is a critical element in that, in that sphere of influence. That's where CSBG sits within the Office of Community Services, excuse me. Office of Community Services is a department or an office within ACF. The current political appointee appointed by the president to be the director of the Office of Community Services is Dr. Laniqua Howard. She's the first woman on our slide here. Dr. Howard has been an amazing partner through all of this, these last few months of COVID since she arrived on scene. She was one of the first political appointees at HHS because community action is important. She also oversees LIHEAP and LIWAP the new water assistance program, social services block grant, and the community economic development program. She, as you know, CSBG then flows to the state CSBG offices, and we'll talk about their national association here in a moment. OCS monitors the states. The states monitor local agencies. The feds, again, you have Dr. Laniqua Howard, and then Sharice Johnson is the director of the Division of Community Assistance. So you'll hear both of their names um, periodically, and so that gives you a bit of a frame of reference about who they are. So the other net, one of the other national partners is NASCASP. That's the hardest acronym we've got. Well, answer, it's also pretty hard, but NASCASP is, is a tough one too. The National Association for State Community Services Programs. They're the national association that work with the state CSBG offices and the state weatherization offices, your state folks that you partner with. And I think we, again, have some state folks on today. They do conferences. I go to their conference, have for a number of years. I encourage you to go to an ASCAS conference as well. They do one in the winter and one in the fall. They do the CSBG annual report, which is that document that kind of takes all of that um, CSBG annual report data that you submit every year to your state office, gets compiled into a report called the CSBG annual report. And all of that is up on their website. <laughs> Janae B. Elland is their executive director. ANSERT is the Association for Nationally Certified Roma Trainers. I'm proud to say I am a certified Roma trainer, at least I was. I, I have to I talk to Barbara Mooney about my recertification. Uh, Barbara Mooney is the director and founder of ANSERT. She has a board of directors made up of, of um, senior trainers from the network. They help organizations and state associations conduct intro to Roma courses, um, certify Roma trainers and Roma professionals, Roma implementers. There's a lot of online training, and Barbara comes out to a lot of events to train and speak as well. And we could spend three hours talking about Roma, but so that's not necessarily the point of today. But we we can certainly respond to questions you may have. Um, but Barbara's a great resource for that as well. And finally, the partnership. We have conferences and webinars. 
May is Community Action Month. We'll talk about that at the end of today's session. We do learning cohorts or communities of practice. We have a public policy platform up on our website to help local agencies and state associations advocate on behalf of families to, to tie your advocacy perhaps to a national frame. We have our Leveraging Energy Partnerships Project with the Department of Energy. We have a Center of Excellence focused on human capacity and community transformation. I'm the CEO of the partnership. I also say we do two big events a year. Our next big event is February 234, which is our winter conference. It'll be online this year because of COVID. Two years ago, we were in Puerto Rico. Um, we usually we go to warmer climates, but this year we will be virtual again. And then in August, that week, that last week in August, right before Labor Day, we're going to be in New York City for our annual conference. Um, we usually get 12, 13, I think one year we had 1,500 people on site. Last year we had 800 people on site and 800 people on the phone for our hybrid conference in Boston. I hope that you'll consider joining us in New York City. Our mission at the partnership is to ensure that the causes and conditions of poverty are, are addressed and to support uh, the broader community action network. Our job is to help you be successful. Also want to put a plug in for your state associations, and we probably have some state association folks on, on the call here today. I encourage you to engage with your state associations. They do training, conferences, advocacy. This is, um, I love this stairwell. I always like to include this picture. You see the huggy heart on the stairwell? That's the Kentucky State Association in the Legislative Annex Building. All their congressional members who have offices in that annex during um, Community Action Month got to walk up the Huggy Heart uh, to remember the community action. I just love that picture. It's one of my favorites. Okay. All right, you ready to dive into some, some history? Now, David Bradley will can run a day-long session on the history of the war on poverty. He actually, I think, has a two- and three-day version as well. It's got music, videos. It's very, it's very good. Very cool to kind of experience. So if you haven't gone to his full-blown session, I encourage you to do that. And if you're a state association, think about bringing David out to your conference or to your state to run a full-blown history. But there are points in time that we want to highlight for you as community action folks to kind of have again in your back pocket. There are moments in the 60s, the 70s, 80s, 90s, all the way up to today that are part of our history. And you are now part of community action's history. 1964, President Johnson let us carry forward the plans and programs of John F. Kennedy, not because of our sorrow or sympathy, but because they are right. This administration today, here and now, declares an unconditional war on poverty in America. We must address poverty where it exists. Our founding from the State of the Union. This is a picture uh, that actually hangs in our offices. It's President Johnson signing the Economic Opportunity Act. You can find that online. It's also available, I believe, through the Johnson Library. Um, it's nice to see our history. And so in 1964, again, this is the foundation of community action. The United States can achieve its full economic and social potential as a nation only if every individual has the opportunity to contribute to the full extent of his or her capabilities and to participate in the workings of our society. It is therefore the policy of the United States to eliminate this paradox of poverty in the midst of plenty. The paradox of poverty amidst plenty. That resonates in 1964 and it resonates today in 2021. There were a lot of programs created as part of the Economic Opportunity Act of 1964 and operated by the Office of Economic Opportunity, which actually used to sit at the White House. In the 70s, it actually moved to what's now called HHS. But for many years, um, it was grounded right within the administration. Leeds, <clears throat> Vista, Job Corps, um, Head Start, um, Congregate Meal, Foster Grandparent, Legal Services, um, Neighborhood Center, Summer Youth Programs whole bunch of programs and services came out of the Economic Opportunity Act and the years following uh, that impacted families. Two big amendments help form us who are today. And those of you who are studying for your CCAP exam, these are the two amendments you really wanna have in your back pocket, the Green Amendment and the Quay Amendment. 1964, the monies went directly from the feds to the locals. 
up through 1981, it went from the federal to the local. But 1967, some of those elected officials got a little bit nervous about all this money going to poor folks with a lot, not a lot of uh, guardrails around it. For the good or for the bad, um, I think it speaks a lot about our system, certainly. Um, but this, in 1967, a way to, again to help community action survive, right? Community action has survived for 57, 58 years because it's been able to be nimble. It's been able to be flexible. 1967 was one of those flex points where it was stipulated that local elected officials had the authority to designate who their CAA is in their community. Now, we can talk in, the, in depth around CSBG and what's called entitlement funding. And there's a lot of rules and before an agency loses its CSBG money because it's meant to be protected. But governors, mayors, and others get to designate initially who that cap agency was. The Quay Amendment in 1967 also gave us our tripartite board. Now, we use it to our strength. I think it has a lot of assets built into it. And I just want to also say that our tripartite board, the language in the statute actually says at least one third democratically selected from low income communities, which means you can have more than a third, unless your state law says otherwise, can be folks living with low incomes. But that came out of the Quay Amendment in 1967. In 1969, President Nixon appointed Donald Rumsfeld as the director of the Office of Economic Opportunity. Yes, that Donald Rumsfeld. If you watch the movie Vice, you'll see the Economic Opportunity, Office of Economic Opportunity being discussed and Rumsfeld and Dick Cheney and others uh, being part of that administration. And I always like this OEO instruction written by Donald Rumsfeld, or at least from his office, because it does resonate that this act gives community action agencies a primarily catalytic mission. That's one of my favorite words, catalytic mission to make the entire community more responsive to the needs and interests of the poor by mobilizing resources and bringing together greater institutional sensitivity. Our effectiveness is measured with the, about the impact we make, not necessarily about the services we provide. President Nixon, this is also something for community action folks to have in your back pocket. You've probably heard a little bit that Nixon tried putting community action out of business. And community action fought back. Community action actually sued the Nixon administration. There were memos going out the door. You're going to have to shut your doors. Um, and the network said, no, we're going to fight back. This is a picture of Charlie Braithwaite. It's, it sits on our wall in our DC offices. I get to walk by it when I'm in the office and see Charlie looking at me. He passed away just a couple of years ago. You can find um, one of the last speeches he made or interactions he, he did is up on YouTube, and we can certainly forward that to you. But he led the way to sue the administration and won, and community action survived the Nixon administration. In 1974, President Gerald Ford tried terminating, again, community action. We've been under the gun from the day we were created. But we were able to survive because we were nimble. We pivoted, pivoted again from, the, from being in the White House to the, uh, excuse me, the Community Services Act of 1974, and we were embedded in the Health and Education and Welfare Department, the new, the old HHS. So we became part of the federal administration within that department and became part of the Community Services Administration. Now, looking back, there weren't that many years later until the Reagan years. And the Reagan years were known for many things, one of which, though, was let's take everything from the federal government and give it to the states to control. That was certainly the president's preference that states needed local control or state control. And again, <laughs> the president tried zeroing us out, putting community action out of business. The network pivoted. And in 1981, the Omnibus Reconciliation Act created two block grants, the Community Services Block Grant, as well as SSBG. By 1983, all 50 states had assumed responsibility. The block grant was born and rolled out. And um, there are some restrictions built into the block grant around political activities, as well as voter registration. And we're hoping that with CSPG authorization, that will change. But we can talk more about that as well. So CSPG was born. 90% of the CSPG money at that time, and still to this day, must go to local agencies. It's called entitlement funding. You are entitled to receive that money as a local community action agency. And a lot of other groups want that, those resources, sometimes until they find out about all the other restrictions and accountabilities that come with it. 
But that's because we want we deserve a national infrastructure to fight poverty. You don't want those agencies flipping over every two years. You want consistency in local communities. So 90% of the money needs to go out. Eligible entities who were previously funded were grandfathered or grandmothered in uh, to that and have been able to maintain themselves, they're still alive and receiving funding today. We have many CAP agencies who are 57 years old, 56 years old, 55 years old, 50 years old. Now, some have been new over the years and have come in, and we, we love having new agencies uh, be part of a part of the network. Uh, but we have a lot of folks in from day one. The there's 5% that stays with the state offices for administration, monitoring, etc. And the other 5% is supposed to be discretionary for other anti-poverty activities. Now, not all states have that. Some states give 95% of their money out to local agencies. I'm looking at you, Iowa, that's for sure. But that means that there's not a lot of discretionary. But even if your state has that 5% discretionary, some of it goes to maybe your state association. Some of them might go to other nonprofits. Some of them have special projects that CAP agencies apply for. It just really depends. I also say that I use the term CAP agency. Um, that's my shorthand. Some people use CAAs, community action agencies, um, CSBG eligible entities. You'll hear that from the Fed sometimes, but I, I use the shorthand CAP, so my apologies there. So 1994 is another marker in time. It's kind of the birth of Roma, the results-oriented management and accountability. There was the monitoring and assessment task force that, that worked together to create um, the national goals at that time. There are now three national goals, and we'll talk about that here in a moment. But that, again, is another important moment in time. We've always been outcome focused. People want to say, you need to do logic models. You need to do theories of change. You need to do all of this. In 1994, community action was ahead of the curve on outcome, data reporting, understanding um, logic models, using logic models, and how we do our work. So I'm going to pause here and talk a little bit about reauthorization because it kind of fits within our time cycle. CSPG, again, created in 1881, reauthorized. And why do you reauthorize? It's because you need to modernize your, your legislation to reflect today. And that's a challenge right now. We're, we're under, actually, we're, under, we're working under a 1998 CSPG Act. Has the world changed since 1998? My guess is we have people on today's call who um, may not have been born yet in 1998 or were toddlers in 1998. The world has changed. And so we need a new CSBG Act, but it was reauthorized in 84, 86, 90, 94, and 98. And we're hopeful that this will be the year. I put in these logos here, here. I just wanna pause here for a moment. You see the, we call it the pinwheel, uh, the black and white logo there. If I look at my original community SCAP business card, it's got the pinwheel on it. That was the old logo. And some agencies still use it to this day, which is great, whatever works for you. Um, and then we, we now have the Huggy Heart um, that you'll see here, and we'll talk more about branding uh, later today. All right, sometimes people think the history ends there. The history does not end there. History continues. The aughts brought some challenges. In 2000, the partnership did go through a rebranding initiative. That was before my time here. That's when the Huggy Heart and the Community Action Partner, you see our logo there on the upper right-hand corner. Um, was born. Many agencies spent the next 10 years um, changing names, perhaps, or using building in the new logo. We still see agencies to this day taking the logo and making it their own. We'll talk a bit more about how to do that in today's world um, a little bit later. 2001, we have information memoranda in 49, which clarifies Roma and the need for it. There's, well, there's a number of IMs out there. We're not going to get too much into it today, but I am 49 is the Roma I am. 2004, we were, um, again, presidential administrations love to uh, tackle a uh, community action and basically claim that we don't have discernible outcomes. We pushed back again and said, yes, we do. Um, we have, in 2005, we created then and responded a set of national performance indicators. Roma had been built right in 1994. It was mandated in 01. And um, I'll have to get some of maybe some clarity on that as well a little bit now that I'm thinking about in the back of my mind. But 1990, 2005, excuse me, national performance indicators were rolled out. Now in 07, we had the Great Recession. And in response to that, President Obama, when he was elected, put out ARA, the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act. And I include this here in our history because community action, CSBG was authorized at $1 billion for that 
for, for ARA, just like it was here for the CARES Act during COVID. $5 billion of weatherization. The network really had to step up, spend it, and ramp back down again. And we were a critical element in the recovery of this country from the Great Recession. Now, 2011, it's not just Republican administrations. Um, I was watching the State of the Union myself, and it was, we were still in the midst of the Great Recession. And President Obama, in his State of the Union, says we all have to cut programs we deeply care about in the federal budget, like community action. He mentioned us in the State of the Union, and in his budget that year, he proposed to cut CSBG in half and put our, the rest of the money out to bid. Because what are our outcomes? Well, our outcomes are there, they're written down, they're calculated, they're, they're submitted, they're, they're, they're analyzed. It's a little confusing though, because we're not a childcare entity. We're not a housing entity. We're not a transportation entity. Now, agencies do all of those services, in a variety of ways, but it's really complicated to tell that story and the impact. But we pushed back yet again against President Obama and said, no, you're not gonna cut our funding. We advocated with the network or with our, with our Congress and we pushed back hard. CSBG was fully funded. And by the time President Obama left office, his budget had us fully funded with saying how much we had improved and how much our, our outcomes were clear and evident. So 12 to 19, we did a lot of work on improving our performance management and performance man measurement systems, organizational standards, Roman next gen, and state accountability measures. All were done in that period of time. Now I say Roma next gen, I have parentheses around next gen because we're getting pretty close to not calling it next gen anymore. It just is what it is. National theory of change, new annual report, um, a true integration of all the aspects of the Roma cycle. If you're not familiar, this is our national theory of change for CSBG, as developed by the Office of Community Services with, with help from the, from the network, local agencies, state associations, national partners, three national goals, a number of services and strategies that all look different across America, built on core principles that we believe that poverty is complex, local solutions matter, with a good solid performance man management system, organizational standards, metrics and data collection and data analysis, all built on the foundation of a national network of a thousand local agencies. I'm gonna pause here. Um, Madison, is there anything that has come through in the chat window that I need to pause and reflect on? No, you're all set. All right, we'll keep moving. A couple other things to have in your back pocket. I did mention the CSBG organizational standards. There are 57 standards for nonprofits, 50 for public. Boy, that number just flew out of my mind. I have to go back and double check that actually. Um, we have three categorical areas and nine uh, subject matter areas. There are toolkits on all of these up on our website. So what about today? Today's the pandemic. We're living through it. We are living through a moment in global history. Community action was ready, we responded, we're part of this recovery and we will be resilient going forward. We have a number of tools that we've produced to try to tell that story, including this report here on the right-hand side of the screen, which talked about the early days of community, of community action during COVID. Agencies pivoted, there are success stories in here, technology stories, all sorts of really good stuff. I encourage you, if you haven't seen it, to take a look at it. This is a graphic that tries to tell the story about how much you did um, and are doing during COVID. Again, focused in the frame of rapid response, recovery, I'm sorry, and, and um, resilience, trying to really tie everything together um, in the community. If you're with us in Boston, you saw our video to say thank you. I think we're gonna put it into the chat if we can find it. And hopefully if you have a chance offline to watch it, it really kind of gives you a flavor, share it with your board of what agencies did around the country uh, during COVID. Um, it really is, it makes me cry every time I watch it so I can only watch it so many times. All right, what else is community action engaged with? As I said earlier, our roots are really in the civil rights movement. And here in March of 2020, the partnership board authorized and formed the national Community Action, Equity, and Economic Mobility Commission. This expanded 
our racial equity advisory committee to the board that had been in place for several years to a full-blown commission. We provide tools and resources and training and um, information to the network um, in partnership with the EEMC. The EEMC worked with our board of directors to declare racism as a public health crisis earlier this year. There's a toolkit here up on our website where you can access to help your own local community to consider how you can be engaged in doing something similar in your own local community. We hosted an equity summit in April. The toolkit is up on our site that really summarizes um, the presentations. The videos are available. There's a ton of information up on the website to help you talk, talk to your board, work with your staff, and work with in your community. And the partnership, again, remains a resource to you if we can be helpful. So let's talk a little bit about branding. I keep highlighting that, that that's coming. So a few things that I hear a lot from folks. Denise, if only Community Action had a branding toolkit. Well, you know what we got? We got a branding toolkit. We got a style guide. We got all that good stuff. It's buried on our website. But for folks, you know, as an introduction to Community Action, we want to make sure you're aware that this branding toolkit exists. You can use it or not use it. Um, but these tools are here for you to be creative with. We have huggy hearts in every color, including the rainbow. We use that a lot in Pride Month and throughout the year. So if you develop a new huggy heart in a different fun color, please feel free to send it to us. We'd love to expand our rainbow of colors. And again, agencies use the branding devices in a myriad of ways when they um, market their community, market their community action agency. You can see a number of them here as well. Uh, in no, no, no two of them look exactly alike, but you can certainly tell they're all part of the same family. So we encourage you as a local agency, how can you use the Huggy Heart? How can you use the promise? How can you use the colors to truly make the brand your own? A chance to try that out is in May. May is Community Action Month. It is now, what, five months away, four and a half months away. It's never too early to plan. During May, we have a toolkit it has a sample proclamation. We see governors declaring May Community Action Month. We have mayors declaring May Community Action Month. It's a great time now to kind of plant those seeds to be ready if this is going to be your first Community Action Month to get engaged. There's usually a calendar of events on how you can engage with your CAP agency colleagues from all over the country, whether that's celebrating Head Start's birthday, whether it's, it's Fact Friday or Throwback Thursday. Um, there's always something to engage with during the month of May to be engaged in Community Action Month. We also have a special toolkit for board engagement. Engage your board, engage your volunteers in Community Action Month um, that is also available up on our website. We use branding in our COVID response. And again, branding helps us play a role. No two CAP agencies look exactly alike. But I hope that if, if you're in a role that you might have an opportunity to make some changes or to use logos and branding in new ways, think about how best to use these elements within your own organization. And here during COVID, you can see here, I love these Huggy Heart Get Vaccinated logos with a little Band-Aid on their shoulder. And I think we also had a version at our conference where he was also wearing a mask um, to help encourage folks to be masked and vaxxed. Oh, there he is. There he is with the mask and the Band-Aid. One of my favorite cutest things. Okay, let's talk about leadership development. You've started in community action. I hope you have a career in community action. Now, I will say I was in community action then went to work for the you know, New York Council of Nonprofits for a while before I came back to community action. But in that role, worked with CAP agencies in a lot of different ways. Needs assessments, board training, strategic planning, that sort of thing. But you can have a career in community action. Don't let anybody tell you different. And we have a number of elements here to help you along that path to build your street cred, as it were, in terms of your community action foundational elements. First is becoming a nationally certified Roma trainer, implementer, or professional. And again, answer can certainly tell you more about that. CCAP, certified community action professional. I'm wearing my CCAP pin here today. I got mine when I was at the New York State CAP Association. Changed my life, changed my career path. And finally, a Pathways Peer Reviewer Implementer um, that's kind of coming back online here in 2022. Keep an eye open for that because the three of these things really do work together, I think, to provide you that trifecta of leadership development. Roma training, right? Becoming a Roma professional. You understand outcomes. You understand data. You understand the Roma cycle. 
CCAP, you understand our history. You understand leadership skills and management. And becoming a peer reviewer talks about organizational development, organizational capacity. So it really is that three-legged stool for the foundation and for a strong community action career. The partnership and community action does have a, a set of ethics up on our website. It is in the process of being revamped, um, but you can download it. If you're going to apply for your CCAP program, you have to sign that you're going to abide by the code of ethics. It is up on our website, and there's a lot of text here. And we do a we will probably do a webinar in early 2022 focused on the code of ethics. But just make sure that if you're not familiar with it, uh, download the resources and take a look at it. Um, they, they are important elements um, for our work. So learning, you know, you're, we've been online, I think, for about 50 minutes here today. I can talk even faster, um, if you were wondering. But we have a number of things where you can go and learn more. You could be on webinars probably for the next three months, 24-7. We do have an adult learning platform through Moodle. It's called Community Action Academy. You can actually download the app and learn wherever you want to go. Wherever you're traveling for the holidays, you too can put it on your phone and take it with you. A series of on-demand learning opportunities around health intersections, advancing to gen, family center coaching, a myriad of training opportunities. Well, I probably had this a little out of order, but um, I also want to highlight our community action impact report is up on our website. It was done in 2019, probably needs to be updated. Once COVID kind of we kind of move this through this next phase, I think that'll be one of the next things on our agenda. But our job here was to try to tell the community action story. We got graphics, we got pictures, we got highlights, we got success stories. All that's available to you. And we have this little two pager as well that if you want to share it with your board, your staff, and your volunteers. We are nothing if not modern. We have a podcast. Well, we did, we had six episodes of a podcast uh, before COVID hit. They are available, I believe, up on SoundCloud. And um, we were, we're talking about revamping it and relaunching it again. Um, so we'd love your feedback on that as well. But that um, podcast does exist. It is out there and I encourage you to take a listen. We have a lot of different topics. Now, what more do you want to read? These are three pieces about the bot core body of knowledge for community action. Uh, Maximum Feasible Success, written by Robert Clark, I believe. I believe it's available as a Google book now. It may be out of print. <laughs> it is probably about, I don't know, an inch thick or so, um, chuck full of history, content, some really good information. You also have the history of community action written by Jim Masters, available, I believe, up on our website as well. A number of state associations have that available as well. A bit of a shorter read uh, than Mr. Clark's book. And then certainly Community Action Leaders, which was authored by Delitza Sulamoyo, our board chair, as well as other CAP leaders in the state of Illinois, who worked with the University of Illinois to develop a leadership text based on community action. It's also available. If you Google it, you'll be able to find it. And what else do you want to have in your box? Imagine how much you will know if you read one nonfiction book a month. I challenge you, in 2022, read one nonfiction book a month. Pace it out, a little bit every night, during the day, whatever. And here's a good number of ones to start with. The Forgotten Americans, if you're a policy wonk, Isabel Sawhill is a great text, talks about trying to meet somewhere in the middle, blue and red, and community action certainly sits in the middle, as does Ms. Sawhill and her recommendations. Heartland, Sarah Schmarsh, Rural Poverty, a, a really strong text, a, res, a book that will resonate with you um, if you're from rural America. And if you're not from rural America, we need to understand the entirety of our country. So I encourage you to put that into your toolbox as well. Uh, we had Dr. Imran Kendi join us last year for our winter conference, How to Be an Anti-Racist and Stamped from the Beginning. Both of these texts are important ones, again, to have in your toolbox, to educate, to understand our history as a country, to know the true narrative of from whence we came. The Color of Law, Richard Rothstein also spoke at our conference last year, talking about the history of housing segregation in our country and how policies from day one of our country's founding built in um, discrimination around housing placement, housing development, home ownership, which comes to asset development and wealth creation. $2 a day is something that'll really make you mad about understanding the fallacy of cash welfare in our country. 
to understand that families are not living um, on, on cash. Um, you can get some services, as you know, right, as community action agencies, but $2 a day is a quick read. It's a good read. It's an important read. Made. You can also watch it on Netflix, I believe, right now. Um, just nominated, I believe, for a Golden Globe. But uh, Stephanie Land um, has written this book as well about her. She was a single mom, worked um, as a maid in, in houses, doing a lot of house cleaning and her stories and her story of her life path, what she faced. I encourage you to follow her on Twitter, too. Um, I follow her and I, I find her interaction um, fascinating and catch her on Netflix um, with this movie. How the Word is Passed. That's the most recent book that I've read um, by Clint Smith. It talks about how the history of slavery in our country and the impact of discrimination and structural racism has been passed from generation to generation. It's an important book. And we're going to be trying to find if we can get um, Mr. Smith to speak, hopefully, at our, at our summer conference in D.C. That's my hope. And finally, Evicted by Matthew Desmond. Um, it's been around a while. Probably may, many of you may have read it. It's an important book, again, to have in your toolbox, right? A stories of real people and the, and the challenge of finding housing over the long term. The challenge is what happens with a family when eviction happens. Paying, you know, all of those components from a customer's perspective. A really well done text. One nonfiction book a month, or I'll cut you a deal. How about one every two months? Um, I'm happy to talk with any of you about any of these books anytime. Finally, contact. Um, there are a number of, oh, I put up an old slide. My apologies. Courtney is no longer um, at the partnership. She's now at Whitfley, actually. Um, but myself, Tiffany, Aaron, Mary Beth, we have uh, Tiffany Day on staff. We have Lily Seals on staff. You can see our Instagram, our Twitter feeds. I have one for the partnership CEO as well. I hope you follow it. Um, Community Action Works, we are 1,000 strong. So that is um, a lot of the content that I wanted to share here this evening or this afternoon, wherever you are. I'm across our, it's getting dark here in my house. So I'm going to pause here and turn back to the chat window to see if there are comments or questions. Will the PowerPoint slides be available? Yes, we'll make sure to send them out along with a recording to folks who registered for today's webinar, and then we'll make them available up on our website as well. And if you can't find them, email me. We'll make sure to send them to you in PDF because it's a really large deck. A Community Action Book Club, we've talked a bit about that over the years, if that would be helpful, if people would be interested, if people would read the book and come ready to talk, uh, would be a critical element of that. Um, but that is something that if you're interested, we could certainly look at Look more deeply at, at hosting that. I think that would be fun. Um, there is also Lead Be Home on Netflix, a one hour on homelessness in San Jose, San Francisco, and LA. Thank you, Andy, for sharing that. Um, there's a lot of good content out there and I encourage you to take a look at it. I will lead, lead me home. Sounds great. All right. Another shout out perhaps for a book club. All right. Madison, did I miss anything else that came in through the chat window? No, that's all we've seen so far, but just a reminder to people to throw any questions in the chat or in the Q&A and we can look at them. It's a quiet group. All right. Well, with that, um, you know where I'm at. Um, again, I'll throw up my email address, my Twitter feed. Um, keep an eye open. We're going to be sending an email out shortly about how Community Action can donate to help Community Action colleagues who have been impacted by the recent tornadoes in Kentucky and Tennessee. We have an agency um, in West Kentucky Allied Services whose headquarters was wiped out. We have staff of community action agencies living in hotels and motels at the moment. Um, we help our own. So keep an eye out for that in the coming days. And um, we're coming here at the holiday season. Regardless of when you watch this, I hope you and your family have a peaceful holiday season. And we look forward to 2022. You are part of community actions history. Wherever we go next, it's up to you. Your job is to fight the causes and conditions of poverty, to go upstream, to see why poverty persists and what can we do to dismantle it and to make sure that no family must endure the hardships of poverty, that this country truly has that moral obligation to help families. So thank you. Thank you for being community action. Um, We'll see you in New York City that last week of August, excuse me. I believe we're going to be at the Marriott Marquis in Times Square. So we hope that you will join us. And with that, 
Have a wonderful holiday season, and we'll see you in 2022. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.